Let us rise and sing the first stanza of our national anthem and then remain standing while Dr. Alfred B. Starrett, member of our faculty and minister of Emmanuel Episcopal Church, delivers the invocation. Let us rise. God, who in thy Son, Jesus Christ, hast called us to love thee with mind as well as heart, we ask thy blessing upon this school and especially upon the young men who now go on to other fields of education. Help them, we pray thee, to consecrate the knowledge they have received here in thy service that the power conferred by understanding may be a blessing to all who know them, and the honor of Gilman School may shine brightly in their service. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. We are very conscious of the heat of our gymnasium and apologize for it and apologize likewise for the humidity of today. We are conscious likewise of the length of these proceedings and ask your sympathetic understanding of our feeling that the hour and a half here constitutes the most important event in our school year and particularly in the course of the year for those whom we honor today. We gather at the conclusion of the school's 67th year to honor the 64 members of the graduating class of 1964. It is our custom on these occasions to voice loyalty to our country by singing our national anthem and loyalty to our school by recalling our founders. Of the 25 founders to whom we are all indebted, and especially our graduating class as their most recent beneficiaries, there is now none left to provide us with a direct link with that wise and understanding group which launched this school. Perhaps the most effective way to recall them is to remind ourselves of the objectives they set for themselves and for the school. Their three chief goals were to supply the best method of modern education, to arrange activities which would produce health and stamina, and to strengthen character by providing a distinctly religious influence. 
Thus we have at the outset the tripartite commitment of the Gilman School to scholarship, physical health, and to religious influence. Anyone who comes to Gilman either to learn or to teach is expected to embrace these objectives and to join in the school's commitment to them. And if he disagrees with them, this is not the school for him. It is a privilege to have this opportunity to report on the discharge of our inherited trust during this past eventful year, and a particularly welcome privilege to make our report to this audience. The parents and alumni constitute the foundation of a pyramid of support for the school, giving us our students and also the finances with which to work toward the objectives to which the school is committed. The overriding objective is the achievement of academic excellence. On this, as the primary objective, there is complete agreement among the 55 members of the faculty. In our individual effort to achieve this objective, however, each of us places different emphasis on one or another of several different procedures, some the greater emphasis on much writing, others on much class discussion, some on the formulation of opinion, others on mastery of fact, still others on repetitive drill. This diversity in methodology, despite unity as to objective, may from time to time exasperate parents, as well as boys, for both are bound to wonder why one member of the faculty doesn't proceed along lines followed by another, or why one department handles matters differently from another. It is our belief, however, that so long as the particular teacher shares the ideals of the school, is well prepared academically, is willing to work hard and long, and is affected with a genuine interest in his subject and in the welfare of his students, it is our feeling that this is the kind of teacher we want. There are bound to be further differences in the approach of individual teachers to other responsibilities of the school, differences in regard to such matters as the extent to which we should enroll boys from homes less fortunate financially than the general run of Gilman homes, the relative stress to be placed on one or another of the various roles of athletics to win, build character, improve physical health, or provide enjoyment now and in the future. As in athletics, so also in the non-athletic extracurricular activities, such as dramatics, journalism, public speaking, debating, music, art, and so forth, there will be continuing differences among men of goodwill as to where the greater emphasis should be placed. Differences will exist also in opinions as to priorities in the use of school funds, whether for salaries, for scholarships, or for improvement and maintenance of physical facilities. I pause here to say quite simply to this, the group that is the Gilman community, that any further funds that are needed for these three objectives, salaries, scholarships, and facilities, can now come from only two sources, increased tuition or greater gifts, particularly the unrestricted type of gift which come through annual giving. There was formerly a third source, increased enrollment. In the past, the money required for a faculty salary increment could be secured by simply enrolling 15 to 20 additional students. This is no longer possible, for the school is filled to the limit of its facilities. It is for this reason that it was necessary to increase the tuition for next year. It is for this reason, likewise, that annual giving is being emphasized more than formally. For from it, we hope to finance new projects and plant improvement, thus freeing income for formerly used for that purpose for other purposes, including teaching. The annual giving average of around $15,000 per year for the se past several years will not satisfy this objective, and we believe Gilman's 2,000 alumni and 650 parents 
will and cognizant of the need produce the fifty or a hundred thousand dollars that is going to be necessary. We are reassured in this hope by the fact that others around us have done this well. Thus Garrison Forest receives about eighty-five thousand, Germantown Friends about sixty-five thousand annually, although one is smaller than Gilman and the other the same size. Reassurance comes also from the increased interest on the part of alumni and parents in Gilman's annual giving program, and we are very grateful. It may seem that I've left my main theme, but that is not the case. The peculiar value, the appealing value of Gilman lies in its potential for excellence in education. Realization of that potential depends largely on the individuals comprising the faculty. It is important that these faculty members be able to work in an environment that respects individual differences of method and approach to goals on which we are all agreed, and it is important that they not feel hampered by any inadequacies in the financial structure of the school. Though I have the privilege of expressing these views, they are in many cases only the observed evolution of a consensus that has been developing within the institution during the past several years and is still developing. For many reasons, our efforts this year have been less directed toward moving forward than towards consolidating the base from which to move forward. We are, it is true, moving toward accomplishment of two goals of many years standing enlargement and improvement of the library, which we hope will be completed for the reopening of school in the fall. Annual giving in the circus are paying for this project. Likewise, the long hoped for summer school will become a reality when school starts this summer on June the 22nd. Furthermore, several indices point to the conclusion that the school has been able not only to maintain, but to further improve the caliber of its teaching. But by and large, the year has been one of transition and consolidation. And this was necessarily so because of so many changes. For instance, of the nine office staff members in the upper school, seven are new this year. I pause to give recognition to one of the two who were not new. She has this year completed her 20th year in the service of the school and I ask Mrs. Meredith Minor Janvier to come forward and receive a token recognition of this event. Another member of the upper school uh, staff still with us is Miss Henrietta Rittler, school secretary, who continues to be a very present source of help at all times, and who is assisted today, as always in the past, by Miss Holmes, who graciously returned for this occasion. Again, speaking of the upper school, 20% of our faculty was new this year. In view of these and other extensive changes in the administration, business, and teaching staffs, it is obvious that the transition has been possible only because of the combined efforts of several different groups. Not the least of these is our Board of Trustees, and most importantly, its president, a man of courage, integrity, and intelligence. Another all-important factor has been the willingness of older faculty members to take on extra duties and thus compensate to that extent for the loss of a great headmaster and several senior masters. We are likewise indebted to the new men for contributing so much in this year of transition. There is real sadness in this time of the year when we must say goodbyes not only to the students who are leaving us but also to such faculty members as Mademoiselle Bertrand and Mr. Lockwood and Mr. Villmore, 
all of whom are going to undertake studies leading to advanced degrees, and to Mr. Lemp, who leaves us for the position of staff specialist for academic affairs with the Director of State Colleges in Maryland. We wish them Godspeed and good luck and offer our thanks for their contributions to Gilman. I pause to pay particular respect to our Fulbright Exchange faculty member from Hanover, Germany, whose year with us ends today. Mr. Karl Heinz Rinke has done exceptionally well in a strange land, in a strange school, and in the face of many requests which must have appeared inordinately strange. In recognition of his able discharge of all duties, both in and out of the classroom, and of his superior teaching, the faculty wishes to make a tangible expression of appreciation and to say to both Mr. Rinke and Mrs. Rinke that we shall miss them. Will Mr. Rinke please come forward? present, in addition to the trustees and faculty, representatives of some 600 other members of the Gilman community. I refer to the parents without whom we would not be in existence at all. And certainly without your understanding, sympathy, and help, we would not be nearly as effective as it is hoped we have been in some instances. There has been constant recognition of the fact that ours is a mutual undertaking, and we are indebted for your help in our efforts to make the moral, ethical, and spiritual tone of this school shine like a reliable beacon, though the world around seems sometimes to be without mooring. I come finally to a most unique group. I have never known in any walk of life, be it business, civic, or military, a more helpful, cooperative, and considerate group than this Gilman student body I am now addressing. I am grateful to you for your many acts of kindness to me. The school is grateful for your willingness to assist, nay, even to lead in all that is best for the corporate interests of the organization as a whole. I congratulate you on your superior wisdom in selecting as your elected leaders, only the very finest among you. For the senior class, the sixth form, I save my final word of praise and gratitude. At the outset last September, special steps were taken to acquaint them with the fact that in this year of transition, of so many new faculty members, of our first experience with integration, of an almost completely new administration, in the face of these and other changes, special steps were taken to inform the sixth form that as the senior officers present, they had a special responsibility to lead. They have responded to the challenge magnificently. They are officers have always sought to lead with wisdom, patience, and understanding. Their president has shown the most remarkable prescience in sensing how to come to grips with problems and smooth them out before they materialize. As a whole, the graduating class is characterized by as fine a sense of decency, thoughtfulness, generosity, and consideration as any we have ever graduated. As because of them, we have passed happily through this year of transition and consolidation and have, with their help, and the help of parents, faculty, and trustees laid the foundation onto which to construct in the next year further improvement in Gilman's general academic program. In this sense, as we look forward to next year, this occasion marks a commencement not simply for the sixth form, but for the school as well. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the representative of the sixth form for this occasion. That is the valedictorian. 
He was our scholar-athlete candidate last winter and our representative at the Christian Athletes Encampment last summer. He has served the school as co-chairman of the Advisors Committee for New Boys, as teacher apprentice in a first form Bible class, and in many other ways. And now, in addition to all this, he is graduating first in his class. I am happy to command and present to you James Ira Camel, Jr., valedictorian. Members of the Board of Trustees, classmates, ladies and gentlemen. On Tuesday, September 16, 1958, we, the class of 1964, assembled in the first form room under the direction of Mr. Tickner. A few days before, Communist China had opened fire on Kamoi, and the Alaskans had voted for statehood. Later on that fall, the Baltimore Colts under the direction of quarterback Johnny Unitas, were to go on to edge the New York Giants in the greatest football game ever played. Today, six school years later, we sit here, Gilman students, for only another hour. In our time here, we have seen many changes and much growth. The new scoreboard, the athletic field beyond the oval, the library annex, the science building. All these have been added since that first day. But the material changes are far less important than the faculty changes which we have witnessed. Of these changes, the most important to us has been the retirement of Mr. Callard, who served as headmaster until the end of our fifth form year. Largely through Mr. Callard's leadership by example, his unceasing interest and effort in our behalf and his careful advice, we are what we are today. But if we have seen change and growth, we have contributed to that change and growth. Athletically, we have helped the football team make the permanent switch from losing to winning seasons. We were part of the first undefeated Gilman football team in the last 41 years. We have helped the wrestling team win two division titles in the last two years. Meanwhile, we have maintained the high scholastic standards of this school. For example, in a recent regional physics contest, we took 38% of the awards given. But more important, we have shown a, a willingness to learn and an eagerness to know. Finally, as one of the six forms in the school, we have done our part to help the school. We have won the circus in th three times in six tries. We have run study halls, donated to the various thrives, cheered the teams, and so on. We have also tried to set a tone of close cooperation between the students and faculty. And lastly, and perhaps most important, from 5,525 empty milk cartons, we, the class of 1964, built the largest and most beautiful milk carton pyramid in the history of the Gilman School. All this we have done, and we are proud of it, and yet we know and we humbly acknowledge that the credit for our achievements belongs primarily to our masters, coaches, and parents, not to ourselves. With infinite patience and understanding, they have helped us, encouraged us, and guided us in our years at Gilman. And although we have contributed much, we have received much more than we put in. 
we have received a fine academic education, and we have learned of matters more important. We have learned the meaning of the word honor. We have learned of hard work, both mental and physical, and of the perseverance needed to accomplish them. We have learned in the, in the tradition of this school to do whatever we do to the best of our ability. But now, how can we express our gratitude for all we have gotten? How can we express our gratitude for this education, for the fun and the experiences for these six years? We cannot. We can only say that we are grateful. We are grateful to our coaches who have taught us to play the game hard and fair. We are grateful to our masters who have taught us not only the three R's, but also how to learn and think and study. We are especially grateful to Mr. Baldwin, who in his first year as headmaster has, in our opinion, done a very fine job and who has always shown us kindness and understanding. We are most grateful to our parents who sent us here in the first place and by whose help and encouragement we are graduating here today. May we always remain members, if not students, of this school. But more importantly, may we always remember the ideals which we have learned here, not because they are Gilman ideals, but because they are the highest ideals of men. Thank you. Turning now to those who have been graduated for a longer time than our valedictorian, I want to acknowledge for the trustees, the faculty, and the whole school the increasingly great help the Alumni Association has given us in each of the past 14 years. This period of time includes the construction of the auditorium, the science building, and the lower school extension. It includes the present time when the alumni account for about one-fourth of our enrollment. We're grateful to them for their interest, their financial support, and for their sons. As I had occasion to say at our Christmas luncheon, the association has had the same good fortune as our various classes in that they select as officers men who are energetic, wise in counsel, and well qualified to lead. The present president carries on a great tradition in more ways than one. It is with constant appreciation for what the alumni have done for us and for what he is doing that I present Dr. D.C. W. Finney, president of the Alumni Association, who was awarded the Fisher Medallion in the class of 1943. Mr. Baldwin, Mr. Emery, Dr. Starrett, members of the graduating class of 64, members of the board, members of the faculty, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a privilege to speak to you today as the president of the Gilman Alumni Association. No popular speech was ever made about money, particularly when it's about giving money, and particularly when it's about you giving money. However, after reviewing my year as president of the Alumni Association, the one event here at Gilman that makes it obvious what my message is today to you is the advent in its broadest sense of annual giving. I cannot take the credit for starting this, but I have had a great pleasure in helping the beginning of this all-out annual giving that we are starting now at Gilman. So why annual giving? As Mr. Baldwin said to you, 
it has become obvious that maintenance, repairs, and improvements of the plant here at school cannot be written off to tuition income without substantial tuition increases. No one wants this. Therefore, of necessity, it has become obvious that annual giving in a broader sense has had to be started and has started here at Gilman. What does this mean? What have we done and what so far have we achieved? So far, the board in August of 63 appointed a development office in the school and as its director, Chuck Emmons, class of 1923. In his short tenure of office, Chuck is to be commended for getting annual giving off the ground in such wonderful fashion. I particularly want to thank him for all his help to me in my years as president of the Alumni Association. Secondly, we had a meeting here at school in March of, 19, of, of this year in which over 50 alumni came, representatives of the executive committee of the Alumni Association, other fellow alumni who are class secretaries and fiscal agents of various classes, all voluntary, all with one purpose in mind, to organize an efficient fundraising campaign, which is always such an important part of successful annual giving. This now is in progress, and this, we hope, will continue to make our goals rise each year. So now, what to date have we achieved? The latest figures show 777 gifts from alumni, parents, and friends in the amount of $27,631. This represents over a 25% increase in number of gifts and about a 50% increase in amount of money over last year. I would be remiss not to mention that included in this gift is a gift of $109.28 from the class of 1965, still here in school. For these gifts, I want to personally thank each and every one of you. In closing, may I say that here at Gilman, we have a job to do, to promote the necessity of and to support to our utmost our annual giving campaign. This can only be done through you. Help us please as alumni, help us please as parents, help us please as friends of the school. You of the graduating class of 1964, do not forget Gilman. Gilman needs you, and Gilman will not forget you. Thank you. Is listed on the enclosure in your program. We congratulate the boys who have won this very notable distinction. You will note that four received the highest honors, meaning 95 or over. 47 received high honors, meaning 90 to 95. And 99 received honors, the range here being 85 to 90. And this latter group being nearly 31% of the student body. This is a significantly greater number than have ever been on Gilman's academic honor roll heretofore. Citations for conspicuous service to the school have been announced and posted, and the list of those names is likewise included in your commencement folder. Our special thanks go to these boys for their fine spirit and contribution to the welfare of the school. It is reassuring to note that the student council and the faculty which together selected this list felt that as many as 10% of the student body should be so cited for both the first and second term. I am adding to this list a citation I shall call an award for impressive integrity. The young man being cited received last week from the English department a book for summer reading, and upon opening it, found therein a $100 bill, crisp and I believe cool. 
he immediately brought it to the office. And unless it is claimed, it will go to our annual giving fund. I ask that third former Pope Furman Brock III rise in his place. Before making the various awards which are customarily given at commencement, I express again our thanks to the many donors who have made possible prizes which recognize accomplishment in many fields. In making these awards, we are conscious of the fact that many boys will not receive public recognition on this day, boys who have contributed significantly to the school in ways where no specific award is made. I hope that they may sense in a personal way our great appreciation for what they have done for us, generously and without thought of recognition. I shall begin with the awards in the various branches of athletics. As the junior tennis tournament has not been completed, the first award is the Mrs. John M. T. Finney Senior Tennis Cup, which is given each year by Mrs. George G. Finney. I will ask the winner of the Senior Tennis Tournament, Raymond Buck Lou, who won it likewise last year, to come forward and receive this cup. Culver Football Award, represented by the large cup on the table, was established by Mrs. Milton C. Whitaker in memory of her two sons, John K. Culver, Jr. of the class of 34 and Robert F. M. Culver of the class of 37. This cup is inscribed each year with the name of the varsity football player, best player. The award this year goes to James William Isaac. The C.B. Alexander Jr. Wrestling Cup was established in the spring of 1948 by Mr. Holmes M. Alexander, Jr. of the class of 26. In honor of his brother, Charles B. Alexander, Jr., who was killed in action in Germany in 1945. It is awarded to Gilman's best wrestler, and this year the award goes to two boys, William Thomas Anderson and Thomas Springer Beck. The Class of 39 Basketball Trophy is presented by the 1939 Gilman Basketball Team in honor of their classmates Edwin G. Bacher, Tyler Camel, John G. Thomas, and George Carl Westerlin, who died in the service of their country in World War II. And this is awarded to that varsity player who best combines fair play, leadership, and skill in this sport. And the award this year goes to James William Isaacs. <laughs> the Tyler Camel Lacrosse Cup was established in the spring of 1945 by Mr. and Mrs. Ferris Thompson in honor and memory of Tyler Camel, 
of the class of 39 who was killed in action in the Great War. This cup is presented to the team's most valuable player who has shown leadership and true sportsmanship throughout the season. The award this year goes to two boys, Thomas Springer Beck and Jeffrey Bernard Miller. The Alumni Baseball Cup is presented by the Alumni Association of the school to be kept in the school and inscribed with the name of the boy who has been of greatest service to his team. And the award this year goes to William Thomas Anderson. C. David Harris, Jr. Tennis Cup was established in the winter of 1962 by the class of 1959 in memory of their classmate, Dave Harris. This award is given each year to that varsity tennis player who in his ability and dedication has made the greatest contribution to the team. The trophy remains in the school and has the name of the winner engraved on it. The award this year goes to Raymond Bucklew, winner of the Maryland Scholastic Association Championship on May 28th. Raymond. William Cabell Bruce Jr. Athletic Award, Athletic Cup, is awarded to the boy in one of the four upper forms most conspicuous for general proficiency in athletic sports and exercises during the past two years, and this without having incurred the reproach of questionable conduct in any respect. The large cup on the table to my right remains in the school and has the name of the winner engraved on it each year. The award this year goes to two boys, Thomas Springer Beck and James William Isaacs. Now we come to the academic awards. We have awarded at morning assembly certain prizes which pertain to lower forms and prizes offered by the alumni of Franklin and Marshall College, Brown, Yale, and Harvard Universities. These are announced in the current issue of the news which will be available immediately after this ceremony. As I read the names of the winners of the scholarship prizes, I ask that all six come forward as a group. They are, for the first form, William Dawson Lynn, Jr. For the second form, and please come forward, Christopher Reed West. For the third form, Harvey Ira Pass. For the fourth form, Robert Hanson Miller. For the fifth form, Frederick Graf Whelan III. And for the sixth form, James Ira Camel, Jr. First form.
We ask the leading boy in the upper school, the boy who has achieved the highest average, to come forward alone. He is first in scholarship among all boys in the upper school. He is Robert Haxall Johnson, who led the school in 1963 also. Armstrong prizes for prose and poetry are offered to stimulate composition among boys of the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth forms. One prize is for the best lyrical verse contributed to the blue and gray, and the other for the best imaginative prose submitted to the same magazine. They are offered in memory of Mrs. Alexander Armstrong, Sr. The award for prose goes to Douglas Gustav Green and the award for poetry to Albert Gallatin Warfield III. Blue and Gray Prose Prize for first and second formers this year is awarded to David Halstead Schweitzer. David. Elizabeth Woolsey Gilman Prize of Books is given annually through the legacy of Judge John M. Woolsey of New York in memory of his aunt, Mrs. Daniel Court Gilman, to that boy in one of the upper three forms who passes the best examination on books, the reading of which is not required as a part of the school curriculum. The senior award this year goes to Martin McKee Lundberg and the junior award to George Neal Means. Mrs. J. Crossan Cooper Debating Cup, which stands all the way to the right on the table to my right, was presented to the school in 1913 by Mrs. J. Crossan Cooper, and each year since that time, the names of the members of the winning team in the final debate between the Areopagus and the Knicks are inscribed upon it. It now lists... of over half a century. The topic of the final debate this year was resolved that it is a good time in which to live, and I am glad that the affirmative side, the Knicks, won the debate. I ask the members of the winning team this year, whose names are inscribed on the cup, to rise at their seats as I read their names. David Ward Allen, Douglas Gustav Green, Stephen Johnny Mason. <laughs> the Dr. J.M.T. Finney Sr. debating prizes were given for many years by Mrs. J. John M.T. Finney whose interest and concern for the school was strong and unfailing. 
and since her death, the prizes have been continued by Mrs. George G. Finney. They are in the form of books awarded to the outstanding speakers in the 51st Annual School Debate. The prizes are given this year to first speaker, Douglas Gustav Green, and second speaker, David Ward Allen. Six form speaking prizes in the form of books are awarded to the two boys who deliver the best speeches in the annual speaking contest, which is held among leading speakers in the sixth form. The name of the first speaker is inscribed upon a cup given by T. Courtney Jenkins, Jr., of the class of 44, and Charles Frick Jenkins, of the class of 45. The first speaker this year is David Stephen Rodler Abramson, and the second speaker is James Hamilton Easter, Jr. <laughs> the other finalists were David Ward Allen, Douglas Gustav Green, and Andrew Philip King, whom I ask to stand because all received honorable mention. <laughs> the Cameron debating medallion is given by Mr. Broadnax Cameron of the class of 14 in memory of his father, George Cameron, Jr., and his mother, Mary Broadnax Cameron. It is awarded each year by the debating advisors for excellence in debating based upon the work in the fifth and sixth forms and in the final debate. The award this year goes to Stephen Johnny Mason. Alex Randall, Jr. Memorial Prize is donated by the friends and parents of Alex Randall, Jr. of the class of 42 who died valiantly in World War II. It is awarded to that boy who has been outstanding in his interest and contribution to literary or publication activities or has encouraged younger boys in these fields. And the award this year goes to John Fife Symington III. The class of 1952 Drama Prize is made possible by members of that class and is awarded each year to that member of the graduating class who has shown exceptional interest and aptitude in dramatics during his school career. This year, the award goes to John Allen Bryson. In honor of Dr. John M. T. Finney, Sr., who was president of the Board of Trustees for 30 years, Mr. Richard F. Cleveland gives each year a prize of $75 to be awarded to that member of the graduating class who submits the best written discussion or essay on some current aspect of democracy. The very timely subject of this year's essay is the Contingencies of Presidential Disability and Succession, a History and a Proposal. The award this year goes to John Allen Bryson. Honorable mention in this contest goes to two boys whom I will ask to rise in their places. John Redwood III of the sixth form and Philip T. 
Timothy Barker of the Fifth Form. The Lewis Alma Woodward Award was established in 1956 by the parents and friends of Lewis Woodward, an outstanding member of the class of 1958. The award in his honor and memory is given each year to a member of the third form who has revealed in largest measure qualities of leadership, enthusiasm, and loyalty, which were strikingly characteristic of Lewis Woodward. And it gives me great pleasure to present this award to Frederick Barton Harvey III. The Science Prize was established in 1956 in mem memory of Meredith Minor Janvier, a member of the class of 1918, long a teacher of science in this school, and for many years until his death, chairman of the science department and dean of the faculty. It is awarded to that fifth or sixth former who has evidenced interest and ability of a high order in the field of science and this year is awarded to William Lowell Stafford. <laughs> the Williams College Prize for General Proficiency in Latin is given to that member of the fourth, fifth, or sixth form who is deemed by the department to be most proficient in Latin. The award is made possible by the Baltimore alumni of Williams College, and this year is made to Frederick Graf Whelan III. <laughs> the Herbert E. Pickett Prize for General Proficiency in History was established in 1961 by Walter Lord of the class of 1935 to honor the memory of an inspiring teacher at Gilman from 1913 to 1939. Mr. Pickett was a devoted friend and a delightful, entertaining companion of a host of men and boys through the years. The award goes to the boy in one of the two upper forms who has shown the greatest general interest and proficiency in history as displayed not only in the classroom but outside as well. And this year is made to Stephen Johnny Mason. The prize for proficiency in French is awarded by the Alliance Française to that boy in the sixth form French class who is deemed by the department to be most proficient in that language and is awarded this year to Albert Gallatin Warfield III. prize for proficiency in mathematics presented by the Princeton Alumni Association of Maryland is awarded to that boy in the upper form who passes the best examination in that subject. The name of the winner is placed on a permanent tablet in the main school hallway and this year the prize is awarded to James Ira Camel Jr. The DKSD Fisher Nature Study Award was established in 1955 by Mrs. DKSD Fisher in memory of Mr. Fisher, the last surviving founder of the school, 
whose faith and devotion as founder and trustee sustained and advanced the school from 1897 until his death in 1953. The award is made to that boy in one of the upper three forms who through his studies, reading, and activities has developed a real interest, understanding, and appreciation of some field of natural history. The award th this year goes to Arthur Guy Conklin. Each year, there are a number of boys to whom the faculty feel especially indebted for helpfulness and contributions which have added greatly to the success and happiness of the year's work. Though it is always difficult to single out only a few boys, we have done so this year, and on behalf of the faculty, I would like to present to nine seniors framed etchings of the school as an expression of our appreciation. I will ask these nine boys to come forward as a group and I will read from the inscription on the etching citing their contribution. James Ira Camel, Jr., James Nicholas Sianus, Jr., Peter Gibbons Neff, Martin McKee Lundberg, Jeffrey Bernard Miller, Robert Graham Pine, William Lowell Stafford, John Fife Symington III, and Sturdivant Ford Weisskettle. To James Ira Camel, Jr., from the faculty with appreciation for his consistent devotion to excellence in scholastic work, in athletics, and in help to younger boys. To James Nicholas Sianus, Jr., from the faculty with appreciation for the finest possible example of constant cheerfulness and unflagging perseverance. To Peter Gibbons Neff from the faculty with appreciation for his rugged loyalty to the highest ideals of the school and his devotion to hard work. To Martin McKee Lundberg from the faculty with appreciation for his ready willingness to perform any and every job needing to be done. To Jeffrey Bernard Miller from the faculty with appreciation for his consistent academic excellence, devotion to the school, and effective contribution in many activities. To Robert Graham Pine from the faculty with appreciation for his courteous cooperation and his quiet and modest performance of jobs that contribute to the welfare of the school. To William Lowell Stafford from the faculty with appreciation for his conscientious dependability and his eager helpfulness. To John Fife Symington III from the faculty with appreciation for his inspiration to the student body and constructive use of his position as editor of the news. To Sturdivant Ford Weisskettle from the faculty with appreciation for his cheerfulness and unfailing helpfulness. Thank you. Thank you. The Fenimore Award was established in 1963 by Mr. Fenimore in loving tribute to the memory of Eddie Fenimore, class of 1959, whose extraordinary courage, determination, perseverance, and accomplishment have inspired all who knew him. It is conferred upon the senior who has best exemplified these qualities while a student at Gilman School. The, the award consists of a gold medallion the size of a silver dollar, which can always be carried in one's pocket, and goes this year to two boys, Brooks Paul Johnston, uh, Bragdon and Robert Winter Locke III.
Peter P. Blanchard Award is made possible by a fund donated by the children and relatives of Mr. Blanchard, who was business manager of the school from 1917 to 1944. It is awarded to that boy in the upper school who, by his cheerful helpfulness in many ways, has greatly contributed to the successful and pleasant life of the school. These qualities were outstanding in the life of Mr. Blanchard, in whose memory the prize is given, and this year the award goes to John Albert McKay. Daniel Baker, Jr. Memorial Award is a prize of $100 and is given in memory of Mr. Daniel Baker, Jr. by his stepson, Dr. Mason F. Lord, to that member of the graduating class who, through service and by reason of his life and character, has contributed to the general welfare and ideals of the school. And the award this year goes to Richard Kemp Slaughter. The last prize is the William A. Fisher Medallion, which was established by the late Mrs. William Cabell Bruce in honor of her father, Judge William A. Fisher, the first president of the Board of Trustees. It is given only to a member of the fifth or sixth forms who has been in the school for three consecutive years, is in complete and regular standing in his form, and is closing his school career. The medallion is given among boys of high standing in scholarship to that boy who has rendered the highest service that can be rendered the school by leadership based on the influence of character. And the award this year is made to James William Isaac. singular good fortune for my first time, and I hope it will not be my last, to introduce the president of the Board of Trustees. I referred to him earlier as a man of courage, integrity, and intelligence, and to these qualities should be added the word coined by the January 15th, 17th Morning Sun editorial, which commended his level-headedness. For our more immediate purposes here at Gilman, I would say simply Mr. Richard W. Emery, Gilman 31, for whom all the faculty have the highest respect and affection. Mr. Emery. <laughs> Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Baldwin, uh, members of the faculty, sixth form graduates, parents, friends, fellow trustees, I don't so whether anybody recognizes me after that introduction, certainly I don't recognize myself. <laughs> Someday I want to give a speech on uh, Gilman, but uh, the only chance I get is at Founders Day, and when they finally get down to me, I realize that uh, everybody's hot and tired and they want to get on with the show. I do want to say, though, that uh, I'm terribly impressed with the Gilman faculty. I think every year it gets better and better. And uh, we had a big loss this year with Henry Callard's retirement, but I, I think the school came up with a, another great leader in Ludlow Baldwin. I never had any doubt about it. And I think uh, the year has proved that we were lucky to have somebody like Ludlow take over. And the faculty, I'm sure, is as fine as uh, any school in the country, and I want to thank them because without the faculty, we have no school at all. To the sixth form, <clears throat> I want to 
wish them all the luck in the world, and uh, I hope that they won't have to come back here year after year like I do and give out uh, these uh, diplomas because uh, Mr. Baldwin wants me to stay on, but I really think it's somebody else's turn to do it. But anyway, anything that I can do for Ludlow Baldwin, the faculty in Gilman School, I'm glad to do. As is our custom here, the diplomas will be presented by the president of the Board of Trustees. David Rodler Abramson. <laughs> David Ward Allen. <laughs> William Thomas Anderson. William Carlisle Barton. <laughs> James Wheelock Beers. <laughs> Brooks Paul Johnston Bragdon. Thomas Springer Beck. <laughs> Robert Anderson Brown. <laughs> That's all right. John Allen Bryson. James Ira Camel, Jr. <laughs> Thomas Mark Kaplan. <laughs> Ronald Keith Chelton. Walter Steele Blackmer Childs. <laughs> James Nicholas Cianus, Jr. <laughs> Caspar Ezra Klein III. Brian Coffey. <laughs> Aldrich Barton Davis. <laughs> Paul Trimble Duvivier. James Hamilton Easter, Jr. <laughs> Forrest Craig Flanders. <laughs> Peter Gibbonsnap. Joshua Thomas 
Gillelan II. <laughs> Douglas Gustav Green. <laughs> James Dunn Hardesty. Robert Leith Herman. <laughs> Nicholas Taylor Eilif. <laughs> James William Isaacs. David Starr Johnson, Jr. <laughs> Jeffrey Child Jones. <laughs> Arthur Guy Kaplan. Frederick Lines Kelly. <laughs> Andrew Philippe King. <laughs> Robert Winter Locke the Third. John Wesley Gwynn Lowe. <laughs> Martin McKee Lundberg. <laughs> John Kenneth McLean. Stephen Johnny Mason. Stuart Ray McCarthy. John Albert McKay. Robert Neville McCormick. John Martin McDonough, Jr. Jeffrey Bernard Miller. Douglas Gary Oba. <laughs> Mitchell Goff Owens. <laughs> Robert Graham Pine. Lawrence Harwood Pretty. (laughs) 
John Redwood III. William Patton Reed. <laughs> Frederick Miller Reese, Jr. <laughs> Samuel Thompson Redgrave Revel III. Russell Purnell Rich. <laughs> Stephen Tottle Scott. <laughs> Richard McGarry Sigler. John Mayer Silverstein. <laughs> Richard Kemp Slaughter. <laughs> Howard Hershey Solid. William Lowell Stafford. John Fife Symington III. Theodore Ridgway Tremble. Albert Gallatin Warfield III. <laughs> Sturdivant Ford Weisskettle. <laughs> James Simpson Wedby III. Thomas Williamston Winstead, the th uh, Jr. <laughs> Jonathan Fairbanks Wood. It remains only to conclude these exercises by again expressing to the class of 64 our appreciation for all they have done for the school and our best wishes for college and success thereafter. There is no doubt that they have left a fine and lasting imprint on the school and there is likewise no doubt about the welcome they will find here whenever they have the opportunity to visit. They have trained a splendid group to follow, and the school will be in the capable hands of Jeff LeBoutelier, Bob Stifler, Chris Deal, Bill Baker, and Fred Whelan. There is, in addition, a great reservoir of talent awaiting to be tapped. Indeed, the greatest problem facing next year's Sixth Form Committee is how to channel the energies 
of the unusual number of able seniors who are not class officers and indeed in some instances are not club officers either. This is a serious problem and one that warrants the thoughtful consideration of the whole school as well as senior officers and student council and faculty. There is opportunity here for each senior to work into a position of real responsibility and thus start while still in the school, that training which Gilman would like all its students to have in contributing to the welfare of those around them. Training, that is, in being active, participating, contributing citizens. To the whole school, those leaving us for college, as well as those who will again be working with us next year, the faculty says, well done, and extends best wishes for a happy, constructive, and well-deserved vacation. We will conclude with the great hymn which we at Gilman like to think is the school's own, O oh God, our help in ages past. And then the final stanza of America, and we will thereafter remain standing for the benediction by Dr. Starrett. After the benediction, I ask that we follow last year's procedure in leaving. That is, the audience will please remain in their places so that the school can go out quickly and thereby relieve the congestion. The graduating class will remain briefly in the forward part of the auditorium to be greeted by the trustees and the faculty who will not file out with the lower forms, but will be in the front to speak to parents and friends. Let us rise and sing, O oh God, our help in ages past. Unto God's gracious mercy and protection we commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you strength in his service this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>